<laughs> Welcome to Hometown Church. My name is Spencer Bernard. I'm one of the pastors here, and you are? I'm Lisa Bernard, his wife, which is important for today's message. How come? Well, I believe you're talking on marriage this morning. Yes, the message today is called Thriving in Marriage, and it's part of our series called Satisfied. And we have been married, do you know how long we've been married? It's a milestone, 30 years. 30 years. And would you say we're thriving? I would. Okay, I would too. So that's coming up. And also, do you know what season this is? Fall. Fall? No. Autumn. Autumn? No, small, <laughs> small group season. It is small group also season. Also small group season. Yeah, also small. Okay, also small group season. If you haven't signed up yet for a small group, just go to hometownchurch.com and you click on Get Involved, and you can see all the small groups that we have available, and you can find one just right for you. And... And I'd like to say about small groups, this is a perfect time to join a small group, you guys. Some groups meet over Zoom. Some mm -hmm. will meet in, per uh, in person, distancing. But I'll tell you, over this season of COVID, it has meant so much to me for us to be able to meet with our yeah. small group on a regular basis. Yeah. It just really it makes us feel connected. Absolutely. And by the way, if you're brand new and you just want to sort of test the waters, we have a great option for you. Pastor Jeff Gruen has a special three-week small group. It's only three weeks. Nice. That's a good one. You can commit to that. Three yeah, weeks. three weeks. And it's called Exploring Hometown. And you can find that right on our website, hometownchurch.com. Click on Get Involved, and then you can find the details there. And right now, just to add on to all of that, we have a special small group video for you, so stay tuned. All right. Wake up those of you whose brain's been on remote since spring. Wake up all of you whose family is tired of all those off-key notes you sing. It's time for a reawakening, a gathering of sorts. Time to hang in exchange and fellowship with some of your hometown cohorts. You guessed it, small groups at hometown are here once again. There's a crew just for you, for all y'all hometown women and men. Oh, you waited all summer for these fellowship groups to begin again. Months with your kin has left you eager to spend time with friends. With two sips of coffee, a smile, and God in your heart. You're a little unsure of where to begin to prepare, so just start. You're happy as a clam, preparing the way of the Lord. Making sure things are just right, front door to back door, from the ceiling to the floor. And if your team convenes by screen, yes, the Lord still does remember. Moat. Plenty of virtual blessings on hand for all y'all virtual folks. That chair with the cush feels just right. Not too bad on the tush. Just three days before you begin, it's time to begin the push. Yes, those small groups at hometown are right back in the house. In case you need a slight change up from the dog, the kids, and the spouse. Placing seats six feet apart so friends will stay safe. A couple of extra masks on hand for on demand just in case. You you need extra space. Hometown groups are just a place to share in God's grace. Share prayer, scripture, and some baked goodies from the oven when they're done. Yes, sharing the Lord can still be fun. Gone are the summertime blues. Now that you found a group to choose, you have that thirst for your small group's first day of school. Nothing spared as you prepare for your soul to come alive. Coming straight to your kitchen table via Wi-Fi by Zoom, they will arrive. It's been a few months that you can recall being so excited. You're in a small group groove, so don't you try to fight it. Small group isn't the time you tried it. That fellowship flame in you try to ignite it. The Holy Spirit wave just ride it. This will be the year our small groups will simply soar. Every week, hometown peeps appearing on your screen or at your front door. One by one, they will come to tear, to share, and for prayer. Fellowship is in the air. It's everywhere. Sign up and we'll see you there.
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less. Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cold stone, weak made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is the Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace.
Oh, how high would I climb mountains If the mountains were where you hide Oh, how far I'd scale the valley If you grace the other side Oh, how long have I chased rivers From lowly seas to where they rise Against the rush of grace descending From the source of its supply Cause in the highlands and the heartache You need the more or less inclined I would search and stop at nothing You're just not that hard to find Oh, I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Oh, oh how far beneath your glory Does your kindness extend the path From where your feet rest on the sunrise To where you sweep the sinners past And know oh, how fast would you come running If just a shadow through the night Trace my steps through all For the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me Come the pastures we call grace 
Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of. My mom and dad divorced when I was very young, and I always wondered what it was that led to their divorce. Once, when I was about 13 or 14, I was driving in the car with my dad, and I asked him, "I said,、uh, what made your marriage so difficult?" And he thought for a moment, and he said that、uh, his personality was naturally very spontaneous and sometimes even impulsive. And my mom's personality was she was more careful and a planner, and this caused a lot of conflict. In their marriage, and then he was quiet for a few moments, and he said, "I'll explain the rest to you when you get a little bit older." Well, that never happened. He passed away when I was 18. But I was thinking about that conversation the other day, and it occurred to me that I don't think the tension point really was that my dad was spontaneous and my mom was more careful. I think the tension came from my dad was spontaneous and expected. My mom to be more like him. You know, a lot of times、uh, we bring expectations into marriage. Now, some expectations are fine. I mean, we make wedding vows to each other, and wedding vows are, in essence, one partner giving the other permission to have certain expectations. But expectations can go way beyond that. Sometimes we bring、uh, excessive or unrealistic expectations into our marriages, and these expectations can cause a lot of problems. We're in a series called "Satisfied," whether married or single, and today we're talking about marriage. And the name of this message is called "Thriving in Marriage." How can we have marriages that truly thrive? Well, the answer we'll see we find in Scripture. And one of the things that Scripture deals with is the problem of expectations. Now, why are expectations a problem? Well, they very often lead to one of three scenarios. The first scenario is the winner-loser scenario. That's when, in a marriage, you have one dominant personality and one more passive personality, and the dominant personality kind of asserts their will, and the peacemaker, more passive personality, tries to just satisfy their expectations. And one feels like a winner, and one feels like a loser. But the problem is, in a marriage, if there's a loser, then the whole marriage loses. The other scenario, which is probably the most common, is what I would call the loser-loser scenario, and that's where you work out compromises, where one partner will satisfy some expectations but not all, and vice versa. So they both feel kind of satisfied but not fully satisfied. Now, a marriage can work like that. It can be peaceful, but I think it'll fall short of thriving. And then, sadly, there's the last scenario, which I just call total loss, and that's what happened with my parents. In fact, what I think happened with my parents is my dad kind of wanted the winner loser scenario, but my mom didn't really cooperate, and so they ended up in divorce. So, what's the answer to this? Well, that's a question I really struggled with when I was getting married. Uh, Lisa and I—we dated for、uh, several years before we got married. And growing up, I never had a vision to get married. I, I never saw what I thought was a healthy marriage, so I was kind of reluctant to get married. But I was in love with Lisa, and she was an amazing girl. And I, and I knew I would never find another girl like her ever. So I wanted to marry her. 
but how do we avoid what my parents experienced? They probably felt like that when they were engaged. How do we avoid those pitfalls? Because I knew a lot of people that got divorced, smart people, nice people, people that were great, but they still ended up in divorce. How could we avoid that and keep our marriage strong and thriving? What we decided to do is to the best of our abilities, trust scripture when it came to our marriage. And that has made all the difference. Now, let me set some groundwork first. Jesus said something very interesting that applies to all relationships, but especially marriage. He said this, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. So what does that mean? How do we love each other in the same way that Jesus loved us? Well, there's another verse that defines that. This is from Ephesians chapter two. It says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. And here it is. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. To love like Jesus requires more than just romantic feelings. To love like Jesus requires sacrifice. So what's the first thing we should sacrifice? Well, I'd say expectations. We need to sacrifice excessive, unrealistic expectations that our partner will have the same preferences and priorities that we have. We have to let go of some of those because they can be destructive in our marriage. You know, um, expectations defy the very definition of love that the Apostle Paul gave us. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives us the definition of love. And in his definition, we find this. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. And then here it is. It does not demand its own way. Now, why would a person demand their own way? because they have expectations. We can demand our own way loudly, or we can demand our own way in a passive aggressive way. But either way, when we have excessive destructive expectations of our other partner, giving them the responsibility to satisfy us in all these different areas, we can be demanding. And that goes against the very definition of love that Paul gives us. So how do we avoid unhealthy expectations? Ephesians 5 tells us how, in sort of a roundabout way, Paul attacks this issue in a way that we wouldn't expect. Here's where he begins. He writes, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, the word submission is not a popular word. When we think of submission, we think of weakness or failure or giving up. We don't like that word, but submission, biblical submission is really a beautiful thing. Biblical submission is when we, we choose to place ourselves under the authority of another person, to, to value that other person, to sacrifice for that other person. The way I define biblical submission is like this. Biblical submission is choosing to go to the back of the line to go to the back of the line, putting others first. And Jesus gives us examples of this. He submitted. He submitted to his father. We see this many times in scripture. I'll, I'll give you one verse where he says that. He says this in John 5. I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Jesus submitted to his father in heaven. And because he submitted to his father in heaven, he also submitted to, to other people. He submitted to the earthly authorities here. He submitted to the Roman officials when they sentenced him to the cross. But he clarified something. He said this, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. This teaches us a very important concept. Biblical submission is not about weakness. Biblical submission is strength. Biblical submission is strength. You know, um, my family just got out of uh, quarantine. 
uh, one, of, one of my family members was exposed to COVID. And uh, we found out, we were notified about this 11 days after it happened. So we had to be in quarantine for three days. And uh, the funny thing about quarantine is no one checks up on you. It's no one enforces it. It's totally on the honor system. And throughout the day, I would keep thinking of things I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden I'd remember I can't do them because I'm supposed to be under quarantine. You see, it'd be a lot easier for me to just do what I want to do. It's harder for me to choose to submit to the authorities and stay in quarantine. And that's how biblical submission is. We choose to do it, and it takes the greater strength to choose to do it. And Jesus modeled that for us. Let's go back to the verse now. Paul writes, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now this verse says a couple things that I want you to notice. He says, submit to one another, okay? So we see submission is a two-way street. And in the very next passage, he's going to be talking about marriage. That tells us that marriage to thrive needs to involve a mutual submission. It's not just a one-way street. Then he also says our motive for doing it is out of reverence for Christ. So that takes away that whole dynamic of, you know, I don't want to submit to this person because uh, they're not worthy or, you know, they haven't earned it or things like that. Uh, that's taken completely out of the equation. We do it as an act of worship to Jesus. So we mutually submit. Now, the submission is mutual, but it looks different for the husband than it does for the wife. You can think of it like this. The wife is called to submit to her husband by going to the back of the line, but the husband is also called to submit and go to the back of the line, but the pathways are different between the husband and wife. And that's what we're going to see as we look at these passages. Mutual submission, but this mutual submission is different for each of them. Okay, let's go to the next verse. Paul writes, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Okay, so uh, Paul is calling wives to submit to the leadership of their husband. Now, one thing I want you to notice is it says wives submit to husbands. It doesn't say women to men, okay? This is a directive only between wives and husbands. It doesn't mean that all men have authority over all women. This is marriage that he's talking about. Also, I want to make it clear that Scripture does not ever teach that women are in any way, shape, or form less than men. In fact, just the opposite. Scripture affirms the equality between men and women. I want to show you a couple passages here. The first one's from the book of Genesis. It says this, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Male and female are both created in the image of God. It doesn't say that males only or females only or one is created more in the image. No, they're both equally created in the image of God. And this is the only part of God's creation described this way. That means men and women both share certain attributes of our Lord that no other part of creation has. And we, we're both that, we're both equal. Peter, the apostle Peter in the New Testament says it even more bluntly. Here's what he says in his instructions to husbands. He writes, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. And here it is, she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Scripture affirms that men and women are equal, but we are called to mutually submit in different ways. The wife is called to respect the leadership of her husband in the home. What about the husbands now? Let's uh, continue with the passage. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church, okay? And then later on it says this. Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. Okay, so we put those two concepts together, and my conclusion is this. Husbands are to love their wives as they love themselves and more. We are called to love our wives like Jesus loved the church, which means 
we sacrifice. Jesus gave his life for the church. So husbands are called to sacrifice for their wives. That means make your wife more important. More important than what? More important than your preferences. More important than hobbies and activities and and everything else. You know, I remember the first time that this whole principle was kind of tested in our home. And this is a story I've shared before, but it's the best one I have that illustrates this. Uh, We had our first dog who was uh, pretty much impossible to house train, unfortunately. And we had the dog for just a few years and the dog was causing me a lot of stress because she kept having accidents in the house. Um, And I finally got to the point where I wanted to get rid of our dog. It was causing me that much stress. So Lisa and I sat down and we had a discussion about it. And we went back and forth for quite a while. And Lisa, in great strength, in reverence for Christ, finally said, well, honey, you're the leader of our home. I wanna keep my dog. I love my dog, but if you want to get rid of the dog, we will, and I'll support that decision. And as soon as she did that, the whole dynamic changed. Instead of trying to kind of win the discussion, all of a sudden, I could back up a little bit, and I saw she went to the back of the line, and I also had to go to the back of the line. And so I said, no, honey, we're going to keep the dog and we came up with a new schedule. We took her out a lot more often, and that helped with the problem. You see, we could have discussed it, we could have debated it, we could have argued it, and eventually there would have been a winner and a loser. And in a marriage, if there's a loser, then the whole marriage loses, right? Instead, when my wife chose to go to the back of the line and took away the pressure from me to try to win the argument, and I could do the same, then, We resolved the issue, and we were both winners. This is the beauty of this. This is the beauty of biblical submission in the home and how this can help our marriages thrive because it deals with so many micro issues that come up in marriage. Now, do Lisa and I follow this principle 100% of the time in our home? No. Do we follow it 90% of the time? No. 80% of the time? Not sure, maybe not. 75% of the time, I'm gonna go with that. (laughs) We do this 75% of the time, maybe more, maybe less. But my point is you don't have to do it perfectly to see the benefits. You see the benefits when we do it the Lord's way and we trust his word. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, many of you are thinking, There's an objection that many people have. We think, you know, husbands think, well, if I start doing this, then she'll always get her way. I'll never get my way. And she probably won't respect my leadership still. Or the wife is thinking, if I, if I do this, then he'll abuse this, you know, and he'll, and I'll feel like a doormat, you know, and we have these objections and fears and we want to protect ourselves. So we resist this, or, or we, we make demands like, as soon as she starts respecting me, then I'll love her like Jesus. Or, or the wife will think, as soon as he loves me like Jesus, then I'll start respecting his leadership. But when we do that, then we, we fall back into that expectation mindset. And if we feel that tug in our hearts, I just want to direct your attention to our Lord Jesus Christ and his example to us. Look at this verse here. Talking about Jesus, it says, He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you could be made rich. Now, what if Jesus up in heaven would have said, I'm not going to go to earth and get crucified on a cross because what if they don't believe in me anyway? What if he would have said that? What if he would have said, as soon as they start believing in me, then I'll come down there and die on the cross? What if he would have had the mindset of protecting himself? He didn't. He came to this world and offered himself a sacrifice. Why? Because this is the only way that we could move forward to the loving arms of our Father in heaven. It wasn't because Jesus needed to move forward is because we needed to move forward. See, that's love. 
Love is making the first move. Love is going to the back of the line, making that sacrifice. And there's even more at stake than our personal marriages. There's the reputation of the gospel. You know, in Ephesians 5, where Paul gives us these instructions, he concludes this section with a very interesting thing. Let's go to that text now. Paul writes this. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Next verse. This is a great mystery. Here it is. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. This goes beyond just our personal marriages. You see, when our marriages are thriving because we are following God's plan for marriage, it shows the world the gospel. It shows the world the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. And that means this. For husbands and wives, a thriving marriage is your loudest gospel voice. In other words, a thriving marriage gives God glory to this lost and broken world. So, your marriage can thrive. Your marriage can thrive. Trust what the Lord says. He designed marriage. He thought of marriage. And he wants your marriage to thrive. Not only will you enjoy marriage even more, but God will get great glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, today. You are the designer of marriage, Lord. And help us each to trust you with ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
escape Light in the darkness, my God That is who you are You are way make miracle work Promise keep Light in the darkness, my God That is who you are Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working I'm so thankful our Lord is a way maker Amen. and he can transform our marriages to thriving when we trust him. Also, we want to say a special thank you for being here with us today. You know, we've been having watch parties at all three of our locations every Sunday, and it's been a joy to get back together. But we also know that not everyone is ready to get back together. That's me. <laughs> I'm not ready to come back together in person. So I so appreciate having the online service. And we just want you to know, we appreciate you tuning in and being with us. You are so welcome. And I guess I kind of look at the whole thing as, let's have grace for different viewpoints and circumstances during this time. It's all good. And let's just gather together in any way we can. Well said. So if you're not in a small group, don't forget to go to our website, hometownchurch.com, click on get involved, and there'll be a small group there just for you. And we will see you back here next Sunday morning. All right. Happy fall. Happy fall. <laughs>